you know, I want to talk a little bit about uh, things. Yeah, I'm going to be talking about things today. <laughs> you know, we live in a culture where there is such a celebration of talent and uh, giftedness. You know, we like, uh, we admire, we even idolize people with, uh, with, 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 with different gifts and talents. You know, our favorite stars, our actors, our favorite singers, and, you know, athletes. And, and there's such a, a respect that we give these people. Uh, because of their talent and their gifts. And it's okay to celebrate and admire these aspects of, uh, of, of uh, what people can do and their giftedness and so on. But there is a dangerous culture in the world today where there is so much praise and, and glory given to a person's gift or talents and talents that we don't really care about character. Character is not a priority these days. It doesn't matter if they are drug addicts, they are womanizers, they curse and swear. As long as they have talent, as long as they have their, their giftings can entertain us, we will celebrate them. And uh, we'll put their pictures up. How many of you got pictures of your, your favorite stars and, 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 and football players in your rooms? Can I not see your hands? I bet you Priscilla has got some Manchester United poster on your wall somewhere. Isn't it? Definitely. Why must you put devils, red devils on the wall? Not good. So, you know, uh, we see that in the world. The world uh, creates idols of talented and gifted people because they bring in the money uh, for organizations and... Uh, there is very little celebration and emphasis on character and the message we get, or rather the message that this generation uh, is being bombarded with, the message that this generation is getting is your, your character is not as important as your giftings or your talents. Uh, what you do is more valuable than who you are. That is the message that is being given to this generation. And the reason... I'm speaking about this in church today is because uh, while we see a lot of this in the world, without us even realizing it, this same culture can creep into Christendom, into our walk with God, into churches, whether we want to admit it or not. Today, uh, Christendom uh, or Christianity is more than just a faith. It is a multi-billion dollar industry. You know, we've got uh, movies, we've got our own TV shows, songs, uh, uh, albums, Christian charts, uh, song charts, documentaries, uh, talk shows, conferences, training programs, books, uh, lots of gifted people dishing out their talents in Christendom and there are lots of people who will pay a lot of money to have access to, to, to these gifts and these talents. So it's a huge in industry and there's nothing wrong with that, but we need to look out for the danger where we too, as a church or as Christians, can celebrate and focus so much on gifts uh, and talents and not emphasize on the more important thing in the eyes of God and the eyes of the world, and that is our character. Our character. And I want to look at this a little more and maybe do a little teaching today. Can I do that? Uh, because one of the hardest things uh, for a Christian to understand uh, is, is how, when, when it happens, how can a pastor or a leader or such an anointed man or woman of God uh, who, who's so out there being used tremendously by God, how can these people fall? How can this... Uh, uh, these people suddenly get caught with, uh, with all, ki in all kinds of scandals and exposed in shocking ways and, and be involved in all kinds of things. And we find it hard as Christians sometimes to reconcile this, the, the character issue and the anointing and the gifting that is upon their lives. And there seems to be a gap and, and we, don't, we find it hard to understand the discrepancy. Uh, and don't get me wrong, we are not here to judge anyone. I think none of us can, can stand here and play the role of judge. Not 
one of us because Jesus said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And I don't think there's any one of us here who sincerely believes that they are perfect or without sin. And if you do believe that you are perfect and without sin, then I want to let you know in advance that you're in the wrong place. You're not going to like it here because this church is filled with sinners. Amen. Amen. As far as we are concerned, there was only one sinless and perfect person who's walked the face of the earth. And His name is Jesus Christ. The Bible says, though He was tempted, He was found to be without sin. Only He was perfect. And the reason why we gather is not because we think we are perfect and we are not because we are a crew who thinks we've got it together. The reason we are here today is because we know we are imperfect. We know we don't have it together. We know that we are still struggling trying to get through our Christian life. But above all, we know, but for a Savior, we have no hope. But for Jesus... But for His grace, we have no hope. So we gather here today not as people who are perfect, but of people who knows we need a Savior. And we know that in, only in His name, in the name of Jesus, can we be saved. Only by His blood. If you're here feeling condemned and feeling you're not good enough, I want to let you know that you're in the right place. You're in the right place and you have a right Savior. The Savior we just worship, He's the one that He's already paid the price more than 2,000 years ago for the sins that you committed yesterday and the sins that you're going to commit tomorrow. The price has already been paid. He's already put it at the cross. So if you're seated here today, you're not judged for what you did. You're judged by what He has done for your life. Amen? Come on, let's give, give Jesus a clap offering. So the reason... I'm on this topic. It's not because we want to judge people, but it's because the Bible talks about things like this. The Bible speaks about our giftings and our, our character. And uh, when we come to know Christ, when we come into the presence of our Savior, when we receive the Holy Spirit, the, the Scripture says that we are blessed in certain areas. Our oneness with God is reflected to the gifts of the Spirit flowing in our life and the character of God being reflected through our lives. Only the Bible doesn't use giftings and character. It uses the gift, gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. The gift of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. What is the gift of the Spirit? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, it says, There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through that same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kind of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. So the Holy Spirit gives us gifts. We have many gifted people moving powerfully in the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, the Holy Spirit gives us these gifts so that uh, he, he, can, he can work through our lives, so that the God's kingdom can be manifested through our lives. He gives us the Spirit for the work of ministry, so that we can serve the community, so that we can build a church together. The gifts of the Spirit are given to us for a purpose. Amen? Amen. And, and I don't think there's anyone here who doesn't want at least one or a few or all of these gifts uh, manifesting in and through their lives. You know, in fact, we go to great lengths to, to pursue these gifts. You know, we, we, uh, we, we spend uh, extended times in prayer and you know, worship. We, we fast. Uh, we get people who carry the giftings to lay hands on us through a, uh, that we might get an impartation. And it's all good. And it's actually encouraged in Scripture that we do that. But, but there, there can be such a focus on the gifts that we don't realize the more important thing, which is the, the, the fruit of the Spirit to God, is, is missing or is lacking in the church. It's lacking in our lives. We can, 
we can focus so much on the gifts, but in the eyes of God, the fruit should be more focused on than the gift. Because based on Scripture, the gifts can deceive us. The gifts can deceive us, but the fruits don't lie. But the fruit don't lie. Look to the person next to you and say, my fruit don't lie. My fruit, my fruit don't lie. Shekinah, Shekinah. So your gifts, the gifts can deceive us, but the fruits don't lie. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, it says, Beware of false prophets, talking about people exhibiting the gifts, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. But a, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good Good tree cannot bear... It's like some tongue twister. You know. She sells, she sells on the seashore. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. No, can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. We will know people. We will identify followers of Jesus, ones who are sent by God, not by the gifts that they carry, the gift that is upon their life, but by the fruits that is displayed through their life. What are the fruits of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit, the Scripture says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Everybody say love, love. Joy. joy, peace, peace. long-suffering, long -suffering. kindness, goodness, goodness. Faithfulness. faithfulness, gentleness, gentleness. self-control. Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. You know, I've met over the years many gifted people who exhibited very little spiritual fruit uh, with huge issues, no self-control, struggling, gifted by God, used by God, but struggling with pride. Uh, no patience and kindness, uh, very little faithfulness. And, and if, if you don't have much, that, that fruit in your life, you end up doing more damage with your gifts than good. And I remember asking God some time ago when, uh, when some spiritual giants, you know, men of God that I had admired, who God had used to do many uh, great miracles, had fallen. And uh, it comes out that they were, you know, involved in a lot of things. There were a lot of scandals and things that were going on in the background. And, and, uh, and I used to, it used to uh, baffle me. How is it that these people can be so anointed? You know, they can uh, pray. Uh, thousands of people get healed. But yet they had all this, this thing going on in the background. God, wh what's, what's the deal here? What's going on? And God led me to these scriptures that talked about the gifts of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit. You see, a gift is something that uh, you receive. Something that is given to you. When I give you a gift, let's say David Leo, David Leo, come here. If I give you a gift, I'm not giving this to you. Huh? When I give you a gift, it belongs to you. I don't ask it back. When you give someone a gift, the gift belongs to that person. The gift belongs, belongs to the person, right? You don't, you know, if you have friends who gives you gifts, and uh, you know, then when they're angry with you, I want back that gift. Give me back that chain I gave you for Christmas. You know, if they give you back that, that's not a gift. A gift is given, and once it, gives, it is given, it belongs to you. I can't take it back. It would be wrong. Romans chapter 11 verse 29, it says, The gifts... God's gifts and His call can never be withdrawn. Another scripture says it, the giftings and callings of God are without repentance or irrevocable. So it's not just saying the gifts of God are irrevocable. That means once He gives you, it's yours. It also says His calling is irrevocable. That means it won't be withdrawn. And it makes sense. So let's say if I call someone now, I call Sheldon! I can't, if I change my mind after calling, no matter what, 
I, no matter how I try to suck it back, it's gone. Don't you? <laughs> so that even the calling of God is irrevocable. Once it leaves its mouth, it is there. The calling of God is there. And that's a word for someone here today. The call of God is still upon your life. You know, the call of God is still there. God has not revoked your call, has not removed your call. He has not repented of giving you that call. His call is still upon your life. And it's not too late to answer that call of God for your life. Amen? So another thing about a gift is, a gift has to be detached from the giver. So, I said, David, Lord, this is a gift for you. Okay, take it back. Okay, go. So you see, if the giver is attached to the gift, something is wrong, right? Thank you very much. If someone gives you a gift, especially you ladies, if a guy gives you a gift and they are attached to the gift, here, take the gift and, you know, don't take the gift home. Okay? You see, a gift can be detached from the giver. When I give the gift, I am not attached to the gift. When God gives the gift, the, the gift can be detached from God. It is up to the giver. The recipient of the gift has to make a conscious effort to stay in touch with the giver. He can continue to use the gift. He can continue to benefit from the gift, regardless of whether he has any connections with me or not after receiving the gift. You know, I think a lot of us, uh, in fact, he may even forget who gave him that gift, but he can still benefit and use that gift in his life. You know, I'm sure most of us can, can, can identify with that. And you, you know, you walk around your house and suddenly you go like, Prima, who gave us this clock for our wedding? Eh? Can't remember. I can't remember. Lah. It's 20 years ago. I don't know who gave us, but it's still working. Huh? Very good clock. So you see, that's the nature of a gift. You can still enjoy the benefits of the gift, yet have been totally disconnected from the giver. So with that in mind, we come to that curious verse in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. You know, when Jesus says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonders in your name? Have, weren't we gifted by God? Didn't we have the gifts of the Spirit working and manifesting through our lives? And then it says, Jesus will respond and he, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Lawlessness, no fruit of the Spirit, but fully functioning in the gifts of the Spirit. So these are some people, these were people who at some point received the gifts of the Spirit. They were operating in the gifts, but now Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. There was the gifting, but there was no connection to Christ. No connection with the giver. So you can operate in the gifts and yet be disconnected from God. So being gifted by God and being connected with God or to God is two different things. Just because someone operates in the gifts, it doesn't mean that they are connected to God. And it's hard to tell, so the scripture tells us we will know them by their fruits. So your gifts don't define your walk with God, but your fruit does. Your fruit defines your walk with God. Therefore, you will know them by their fruits. You can fool people with your gift, but you can't fool them by your fruit. Amen? Your fruit tells the truth. So if someone is exhibiting gifts, but when you spend this, all these gifts, and if you spend time with them and you don't see the fruit of the Spirit, there's very little love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Know that there's something wrong with their connection with God. Now, why, uh, why is the fruit the defining factor? Because gifts only take a moment to receive. I can receive the gift in a moment through the laying on of hands, through a prayer, through, a, through an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Gifts only take a moment to receive, but fruit only comes by being connected. I can have and operate in a gift without being connected to the giver, but I cannot bear fruit without being connected to the vine. Gifts can come through receiving 
Fruits only come through abiding. Through abiding. So John chapter 15 verse 4, it says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the wine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. A disciple is defined by the fruit that they bear in their lives. Amen? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul lists out the gift of the, of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit talks about um, for, to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, and another faith by the same Spirit, to another gift of healings working of miracles, prophecies, discerning of spirits, different kind of tongues, interpretation of tongues. And he goes on and he talks about the, the different gifts of the Spirit that we receive. But then in 1 Corinthians verse 13, one chapter later, he highlights what is really important. And he says this, now he goes back and revisits the gifts of the Spirit that he had just spoke about, they had just written about. He says, though I speak... With the tongues of men and angels, now this is talking about speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, the, those gifts. But I have not love. What is love? Love is a fruit. So though I have this gift and I don't have this fruit, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, all knowledge, wisdom, knowledge, discernment, and though I have all faith, He's talking about the gifts of faith, the gifts of miracles and healings, so that I can remove mountains. But if I have not love, which is the fruit, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed to the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, which is a fruit, it profits me nothing. And it goes on to list down the characteristics of love. This is not just love, it is agape love. And it, which is, and it breaks down and gives you all the the fruit of the Spirit. Love is the fruit of the Spirit. And he says, we, what he's basically saying is, without the fruit, the gift is pointless. The gift means nothing. So we need to manifest the gifts in our life, but more importantly, we must manifest the fruit of the Spirit. You know, we believe in the gifts of the Spirit here. Uh, uh, we pursue them, you know, we, we encourage people to walk in them. And, you know, we believe that all of you should walk in the gifts of the Spirit. But the gifts must manifest through a life soaked in the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit must be there. We cannot be a church that, that prays for miracles but are impatient with people. We, we cannot be a church that believes in, 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 uh, in, in healing and, you know, and, and tongues and, and all, all these different uh, gifts, but yet at the same time be self-seeking rude. We cannot be a, a people who, who prophesy but have no self-control, who are unkind and are unfaithful. Our fruits speak more than our giftings. Amen? And, and basically, what are the fruits of the, the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit... Are basically the, the, it's basically the characteristics of God manifesting to your life. It's basically God's nature being reflected through your life. And you know, we are given the Holy Spirit that the Bible says that we with unveiled face shall reflect the Lord's glory being transformed into His likeness, more and more into His likeness, so that we become more Christ-like. And the fruits of the Spirit are the, is the nature of Christ reflected or flowing from your life. The first fruit is love. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, we said, God is love. It is the nature of God. Joy. The Bible says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. In Zephaniah was, uh, chapter 3 verse 17, it said, He rejoices over you with gladness. 
peace. He is called in Romans chapter 15, verse 33, the God of peace. A long suffering, Numbers 14, verse 18 says, The Lord is long suffering and abundant in mercy. Kindness, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, His kindness towards us is displayed through Christ Jesus. Uh, goodness, Psalms 31, verse 19, Oh, how great is your goodness, Lord. Faithfulness, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 23, we sing it in the songs all the time. Great is thy faithfulness. Gentleness, 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 36, your gentleness hath made me great. Self-control, James 1 verse 13, the Lord cannot be tempted by evil. The Numbers 14 verse 18, it says the Lord is slow to anger. Self-control is the nature of God. The fruit of the Spirit is basically the nature and the characteristics of God being displayed through His believers, through His people. You know, we can, we can go through this, these qualities and we can't help but get a little worried. You know, how, am I, how on earth am I going to display this fruit of the Spirit? You know, I'm, I'm far from it. You know, I'm anything but patient. You know, I'm anything but kind sometimes. You know, the other day someone cut me off in, in traffic. And, you know, uh, the other day my, someone was rude to me in the office. You know, and, and some fruit came out of me. But it was none of this fruit. It didn't seem or feel or, or seem like any of the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, it was more like a, like a durian, like that kind of a fruit. <laughs> God, how am I going to, to change, to display this? How am I going to bear these fruits in my life? And you need to know that if that is your question, that is your struggle, and you're still struggling with these issues, and, and still struggling displaying the fruit of the Spirit in your life, you need to know, you, I'm going to say something to lift the burden off you, because it says, it is the, in Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is all these things. It doesn't say the fruit of the Christian is love, joy, peace, etc., etc. It doesn't say the, the fruit of the Bible believer is all these things. It says the fruit of the Spirit, capital S. Every time you say Spirit with a capital S in the Bible, it is actually talking about the Holy Spirit, not your Spirit, the Holy Spirit. They are His fruits, not yours. So your goal is not to cultivate the fruits. Your goal is to cultivate a right relationship, a right connection with the Holy Spirit, with Him. And, and the fruit is a byproduct of your relationship with Him. Amen? If you abide, if you stay connected... The closer I get to God, the more connected I am with God, the more of His life starts to flow through me. That's why He says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can bear no fruit. Because as long as you're connected to the vine, the life of God will flow in you and through you, and the fruit will start to be, it's a natural byproduct of you being connected to, God, to the vine. Amen? So our, our job is not to force the fruit out. Our job is to be a healthy tree. Planted, the Bible says, by the streams of living water. Our job is to be connected to Jesus. To walk or go through life with a consciousness of His presence, of who He is, that He is with us. To be conscious that, you know, God is with me all the time. And when you're conscious of Him, you are drawing from Him. You, you are aware that His life is flowing through you. Don't force it to happen. Amen? You know, when you go to a, a, an orchard, you will never hear their sound. That's one sound you will never hear in a fruit orchard. Because the trees are not forcing the fruits out. You won't go, hey, it's durian season. Durian, fruit's coming out. No, you'll never hear that in a fruit orchard because they're not forcing the fruits out. The fruits happen as long as the tree is healthy. The tree is connected. The tree is planted on good soil. The soil is nourished. The, sleep, the tree is connected to streams of water that fills it, that nourishes it, and, and fruit happens. Look to the person next to you and say, fruit happens. <laughs> if you have a healthy spiritual life the fruit will show it will happen you need to stop 
forcing yourself. And, and, and note, it, it says fruit of the Spirit, not fruits of the Spirit. So it's not one tree with nine different fruits. It is one fruit. So it's more like one fruit with nine flavors. It's the fruit of the Spirit. So God doesn't drop this, oh, today is, uh, uh, is, this, this month is, is joy season. So let's have the joy fruit in your life. Oh, next month is love season. Let's have the love fruit in your life. And the following month is peace season. Let's have, no. You get it as a whole. Because you get the Holy Spirit as a whole. He doesn't come within you in parts. You get it as a whole. You get His presence as a whole. And His life is manifested to you, through your life, as a whole. You'll start to see your life start to change. Don't be discouraged if you're still struggling in this area because it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't happen overnight because we have years and years of conditioning. We come from brokenness. There are lots of things, but yield to the Spirit. Yield to the Spirit of God. Spend time with Him. Worship, worship Him. Be connected. Spend time. Be nourished by His Word. And you will find that things within your life will start to change naturally. You will start to reflect more and more of God. You know, the person I was 15 years ago, I don't recognize. And I don't recall making a conscious effort trying to change. Trying to stop certain things in my life. But the person I am today, when I look back, I realize it's the Holy Spirit. As long as I was connected with God, God is doing more behind your back than He is in front of your face. God is working in your life. So our, our job is not to drudge and suffer through this Christian walk, this walk with Jesus. Our job is to yield to the Holy Spirit. And as we yield to Him, as you spend time with Him, the life of God will start to fill you. Sometimes, you know, you may go into that place of prayer, that place of intimacy with God. You feel like nothing's happening. Listen, something is happening. You cannot go into the presence of God and live the same. Everyone who came to Jesus were touched in some way. Sometimes your flesh will say nothing happened, but something is happening. God is doing a work in your life. Amen? You know, I, I started with talking about how uh, you know, it, it's shocking sometimes when we, you know, we get troubled when, you know, great men and women of God fall and, uh, you know, they, they indulge in certain things. And, and this is the reason. And we wonder why they're still moving in the gifts because the gifts and calling of God is irrevocable. He doesn't take it back. But something was missing that is the fruit. And the fruit comes through abiding. I remember them interviewing one, one of these guys and he says, you know, he became so busy with life and, uh, you know, going around because of the gifting. The gifting takes you places. The gifting opens doors and, you know, he's preaching and doing all kinds of things. All of that, his connection with God, his prayer life, his word life started deteriorating. But he was too busy to stop. And without him even realizing it, it opened the door for other things to come into his life. The fruit was not there. So I, Matthew 7, 22 says, you know, Jesus says, I did not know you who practice lawlessness, moving in the gifts, but not demonstrating the fruit. And, uh, and it's not just about the people who are up there and out there. This is for each and every believer here. We can be so focused on the giftings, that sometimes we, we forget that the more important thing is our character. It's our character. Character is that bowl that contains all your gifting, that holds everything together. If that cracks, your whole life falls apart. And how do we develop in character? We abide. We abide in Christ. We spend time with Him and we will start to reflect more and more and more. And that's why the devil, the devil doesn't mind you moving in gifts. He doesn't mind you doing all this, becoming well-known, going around the world, healing, doing all kinds of things. Because, oh, the higher you climb, the better. Because when you fall, it will affect more people. The greater the impact will be. So he tries to keep you, he tries to disconnect you from your time with God. He tries to disconnect you from the vine. 
and we need to fight and to keep our connection to the vine going. And we have to plan it. It doesn't just happen. You need to plan it into your day. You need to plan it into your day. If you want a, a, a change in your, your body, you need to plan the gym into your day. It doesn't just happen. And people do that. They plan it. Okay, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and they, they, they kind of they, they plan their day around these things that are important. We need to plan the day around our spiritual gym, which is more important than your physical gym. For most of us, today God is, you know, God wants you to know that He wants you to get connected again. Some of you have been disconnected from the vine or, or rather you're just hanging by a thread connected to the vine. But God wants you to be connected again because He's got a great plan for your life. And as long as you're disconnected, as long as you're not abiding, you're going to miss out on His plans for your life. Start abiding. You want to see your life change? Start abiding. Start spending time. Start getting connected. You want to see certain things you're struggling with fall off? Start abiding. Start spending time with God. The more we spend time with Him, the more we behold Him, the more we walk with a consciousness of His presence, of His person in our life, the more we start to reflect Him in our world. Your fruit matters more than your gifts. We want to be a fruitful church. I want this church to be called, oh, that church is a fruitcake filled with fruits. Pasta is a fruitcake. Worship team are all fruitcakes. Youth are all fruitcakes. Filled with fruits. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah.